All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. I'm going to do a, a very important installment today about uh, the second case of the Marshall Trilogy. Uh, for those who do not know who Mar John Marshall is, he is only the most important Supreme Court Justice of all times. This book just came out called The Final Founder. Let me read you a little excerpt. 18th and 19th century contemporaries believe Marshall to be, uh, if not the, the equal to George Washington and Ben Franklin, at least very close to that pantheon. Um, da, 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 da. I'm trying to read the synopsis here. Um, this book demonstrates Marshall can be considered one of those founding fathers that what he did as a chief, chief justice was not just significant, but the glue that held the union together after the original founding days. Excuse me. The Supreme Court met in the basement of the new Capitol building in Washington when Marshall took over, which demonstrates that the executive and legislative branch thought of, uh, this demonstrates what the legislative and executive branch thought of the judiciary. Ultimately, this book advocates the founding of the United States uh, ended uh, a little later than before. Uh, obviously, um, it took a while to get the Supreme Court going. And so, yeah, that book just came out um, recently. Uh, today, though, we're going to be talking about this particular book. Um, it's it's a very cool book. I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, In the Courts of the Conqueror by Walter Echo Hawk. Unfortunately, it's out of print. Uh, you can get it on Kindle. Uh, very big. Um, 10 worst cases ever decided at the Supreme Court. Uh, Echo Hawk is actually a really interesting fellow. I met him once um, when he, this book came out, Sea of Grass. It was a historical fiction of his family. He is Pawnee. Uh, really cool, gentle soul, um, salt of the earth, wonderful man, and really intelligent. Um, he is a, one of the first uh, natives to be a, a judge and lawyer and we'll talk about that in a bit well actually i'll just talk about it right now um so uh basically um in the 60s when when walter became a lawyer there were almost no native american lawyers at the time uh then uh you know in the 60s there were about a dozen or less than and you know maybe there's like 50 now who knows but um, he was kind of the one of the beginning uh, folks to to become a lawyer, and his book is really uh, interesting because it's written from the native perspective. So let's get started. Um, we are going to be reviewing chapter five in the Courts of the Conqueror. Let me share my screen. Screen share. All right, let me share that for you. Okay. So here is um, the Cherokee cases. Um, very, very interesting time. So this chapter comes after, let me get a drink of water, excuse me. Uh, the Johnson v. McIntosh case. Um, that is the first case in the Marshall Trilogy. Essentially that case is when the Supreme Court stole all Indian title legally using the law, using the doctrine of discovery, which is, was a very antiquated uh, document um, founded on the papal bulls of 1493, this kind of moment in time where the Catholic Church was the most important, um, you know, in a way like the Supreme Supreme Court at the time, uh, just to, to uh, give you some kind of a parallel. And uh, that case uh, was uh, completed in 1823. This case, these next two Cherokee cases we'll be covering, follow uh, that case almost immediately. And they're called the Marshall Trilogy. And these are the most important Native American cases uh, for several reasons, uh, which we will uh, go over in this uh, presentation. Um, here's a little um, update for students who are taking my course. Um, what's what's coming, uh, keep an eye out. Um, and uh, so these are the these are the core uh, core questions 
uh, I want you to understand or, or think about when you are reading this chapter. Uh, number one, what is the role of the Southern judiciary and legislation, legislators and governors? Um, and that's very important because really what, what this course is trying to teach is how the law was used as a weapon, right? So most people think of the law as it's about justice, um, and that's what it's supposed to be about. But in many instances, um, for example, um, the final solution you know, was totally legal under the Nazi regime, right? Um, and this is very similar to that. This is the final solution for Native Americans. Uh, there's a lot of, of parallels there. Um, think about the role of racism. Uh, Georgia would be the vanguard of American racism for a couple of reasons, which we'll go, go over. Uh, corn tassel, why does he matter? Um, it's interesting because the, you know, the book starts out with corn tassel being hung in 1830 and you're kind of wondering like what is this doing here <laughs> and it's interesting because you know a lot of authors and writers write um thinking that their audience knows uh, something but i didn't personally uh, i didn't know the connection until later which i thought was kind of funny okay so just a brief history of the cherokee nation uh, interestingly, they're actually about the size of the Kumeyaay Nation, my tribe, around 20,000 people and, and around the same size of territory. Uh, although no one knows of the Kumeyaay and everyone knows of the Cherokee, very similar uh, population and, and territory, ancestral. Uh, they greeted Hernando de Soto. This is a very, uh, he was a, a Spanish terrorist, basically, going through the southeast and terrorizing, looking for this gold that never was. Um, hoping to to find gold like they found in uh, the Mexica and Incan empires, but they never did. Instead, they found uh, slave labor, which they used uh, quite liberally. Uh, strategically located between colonial ter territories, uh, they fought. The Cherokee would fight in the French and Indian War, the Revolutionary War. Kind of like the Iroquois, they would, they would form the balance of power in the eastern um, kind of contentious territories between the three colonial powers. Um, the Treaty of Hopewell would be signed 18, uh, 1785. This is a very important treaty for the Cherokee. Um, it's a very important treaty for American history, and uh, we'll go over why in a bit. Um, more, also, the Creek War of 1812, um, they would fight Andrew Jackson's Tennessee militia, where they would slaughter and kill men, women, and children. Andrew Jackson would be discovered and become, you know, uh, uh, propelled to the presidency. Uh, and this would be the, the Creeks were one of the five civilized tribes. Um, so very important tribe. Again, these are they're at the center of American history, which is why everyone knows about them so well. Um, so by the time of 1800, there were 20,000 people left. Uh, disease had decimated. The south, um, the south, uh, the southeast with uh, Hernando de Soto's expedition. It was never the same. Um, then their territory at this point in time was forty thousand square miles, still a lot, uh, guaranteed in the Treaty of Hopewell. Um, the remainder forever to be yours, right? The treaties always say this, and it's kind of like, um, you know, obviously these promises were never meant to be um, kept. They were just for the moment. But natives made natives obviously thought they were uh, forever. Uh, half would be in Tennessee, the rest in Georgia, Alabama. Uh, this is 18, uh, 1785, right? A little bit better look at it. Um, you'd have the Indian land in red, or I guess that's uh, orange. Uh, settler land in that light blue, uh, treaty land in that green. Um, another little glimpse of Cherokee country in 1900, just to give you an idea, because it kind of cuts through all those different um, states that we know of now, uh, even though they're most known for Georgia, right? But um, they were much more expansive than that. Um, this would kind of ultimately be the result, just to kind of fast forward. Um, that territory right there, Right, you would eventually be um, expelled to Indian Territory, later named Oklahoma, um, and this would be how it happened. So it, it's 
we live in the most legalistic society in the entire world, the United States, and everything we do has to be by the law, even if it's not moral. Um, it's the law, right? So you have those kind of things. I'm just doing my job type of type of mentality. No questioning. A brief history of the Cherokee people. One of the most interesting things, and this is what terrifies natives today a lot, is that those tribes that are the most assimilated tend to be the ones attacked and dismantled and annihilated first. Um, and in this case, the Cherokee got the name of the five civilized tribes. They're one of the five. Um, for now, we'll just focus on the Cherokee. Um, and the reason why is they were the most civilized and most assimilated. Uh, they adopted a constitution in 1827. This was after Johnson v. McIntosh. On the U.S. model, most Native American constitutions are based on the U.S. model. Some are completely uh, cookie-cutter copied with no uh, thought and to, to uh, um, kind of match the culture of the tribe. Uh, adopted agriculture, Christianity. They even had their own alphabet in their own language. Uh, they were the first to have a tribal newspaper, the Cherokee Phoenix, the same year as the Constitution, 1827. And this is something that, you know, students often get wrong in my lower division courses. I always have this question is that um, Cherokee actually owned slaves, right? So there's pretty much nothing they could have done besides changing the color of their skin to be American. Um, and they did it all. And this was in hopes, I think, for many reasons, um, to become uh, kind of part of the American society to where you'd kind of like stop being hunted and left alone, right? Most people would would want at this time. Um, so now, now again, in the in the beginning, I said the Georgia was the vanguard of American racism, and this is why. So the reason why is Georgia was where you put all the kind of bottom of society. Initially, it was a penal colony in 1732. Um, this was before slaves, although slaves got here in what, 1619, right, with the pilgrims, the first African slaves. Uh, they still weren't kind of a lot of them yet. Right? It was still necessary to have indentured servants from England. And all these, you know, non-African slaves, Native American slaves, uh, in addition to uh, all these other folks. Um, so essentially, this was a magnet for the very bottom of society. Um, this is where we get the term cracker, right? Poor white Southern crackers, uh, lawless rascals, boosters. Uh, essentially, it's the ghetto, as many folks would, would call it today uh, in contemporary terms. Uh, there's a little kind of map for you. Uh, knowing, yeah, just just notice how the territories were different, right? This is the 13 colonies, not the states that would, would be later. So um, the incentives for removal were a lot. I mean, if you go back to that last slide, that would be incentives not to remove, right? The assimilated part of Cherokee Nation that they were almost the most American Indians you could imagine. However, the forces that were working against us were much more common, much more prevalent, and in many cases, much more important. Uh, number one was land. It's always been the most important. Cheap land. Uh, cotton was king at this time, but you needed cheap land to grow it. Political power shifted to the South, right? And this is where Andrew Jackson would, would launch into presidency. Before then, it was, it was um, in the North. All the leaders, uh, presidents came from up there. Johnson v. McIntosh, where they took Indian title. Um, shift from assimilation to removal, which means folks didn't believe Indians could be assimilated anymore. And there was only one other option. Uh, racism, uh, justification, rationalization, which we'll cover. Uh, and one that always pops up is gold. Gold's discovered in the Black Hills. Gold's discovered in Sacramento. Gold's discovered in Georgia. Um, that's one of the most common um, things throughout Native American removal. Um, role of racism. Uh, one of the things that's important to understand at this point in time was the beginning of eugenics. So eugenics kind of came with Darwin. 
so Darwinian theory of kind of the survival of the fittest, um, you know, the most important will survive, the least important, well, maybe they shouldn't, uh, or I guess the least um, uh, equipped to survive. And a lot of this had to do with mental capacity when it comes to eugenics. Um, it's, you, you would measure the skull. So you had people literally with advanced degrees, doctorates, measuring skulls of African-Americans, Indians, um, and really, you know, saying, proving to objectively that Indians were indeed inferior savages uh, and blacks were possibly a different species. Uh, you had these, uh, another idea was, um, you know, and, and the really the point of both of these is white supremacy, right? It's, it's a pyramid, whites on top, everyone on the bottom. Uh, and you had four separate races. And Indians, were they animals or were they humans? Uh, I don't know. That's the mentality of the time. And the reason why this is important, because, you know, all this happened at the same time of removal. And remember that, you know, moment ago, uh, I just said two slides ago, you know, the reason why you shifted from assimilation to removal is because you had this mentality that Indians cannot be civilized or assimilated in society because they're not one completely human or they're not human enough so it was kind of a degree of humanity that this was scientifically proving uh, therefore they must be removed from society um interestingly when when i teach uh, american history early early american history the french seem to be um very what's what's the word almost this kind of bright spot in Native American relationships. And uh, a lot of this had to do with, you know, reasons why I go in, won't go into it right now for lack of time. But the French really um, would intermarry, they would adopt the culture. They would, um, in their terms, go Indian. And there were all these really uh, different moments in time, different leaders that would really adopt the Native American culture, and you had a lot of kind of mixed families. The thing about it is English and Americans did not do that. But by and large, they were highly race conscious. They were the opposite of the French in many regards. And they advocated for separation. Um, intermarriages were extremely rare. And the idea was separation uh, and again, this is where you come up with these issues of assimilation. Uh, the Spanish were somewhere in between. They um, they would adopt, they believed in adopting Native Americans to, into their society, but in, according to their race pyramid, their cost of system, Indians would be on the bottom, right? So you would have, uh, at least you would have them adopted into Spanish society. Uh, with the American system, they were out of the pyramid altogether on, in the race pyramid. Uh, so, again, you know, the, the Cherokee were extremely intelligent. Uh, they knew how to read, how to write. They were very aware of the law, the Supreme Court cases. And uh, they tried to use the court to fight, um, you know, the injustice and, the, and particularly the removal. They saw what Worcester v. Georgia, um, I mean, Johnson v. McIntosh, excuse me, when they took title away. And in response, they took this case, Cherokee Nation versus Georgia. Um, and this was the very first time an Indian tribe went to the federal court in a major lawsuit versus the state, rejecting the doctrine of discovery. The only way they could do this, however, because states have immunity, was if they were a foreign nation. Um, so they adopted a sophisticated legal and moral argument. They used public relations. Uh, they lobbied D.C., um, and so now it's important to realize the difference, what's going on in D.C. Um, and what's going on in Georgia, because what's really happening is, is would ultimately become a constitutional crisis where, um, which again, eventually would, you know, that's how the Civil War happened, right? They would secede from the Union. Um, but this was kind of the beginning stages where the state was not really paying attention, not wanting to, to play ball on the federal level. Um, so again, uh, this, this is what would happen, but the Indian Removal Act of 1830 was 
it's important to realize this was already in full swing many years before. So by, you know, this is 1828, uh, 27, you have Georgia already doing this. Uh, it wasn't until this is when it became federal, but the state was doing it well before this. So when, when Jackson passed this, he was just kind of, um, he just, you know, the ball was already at the five, five yard line. He just pushed it in the, in the end zone, so to speak. Um, so again, that back to the Treaty of Hopewell. Um, so the Compact of 1802 was essentially Georgia breaking the Treaty of Hopewell. And they claimed using uh, Johnson v. McIntosh that these treaties were now erroneous. Remember, the Indians have no more title. Uh, and they extinguished all Indian title, the treaties. Uh, the Southern, the state judiciary had claimed jurisdiction over Indian. That's really important. Uh, this would have implications in the final uh, case, Worcester v. Georgia, where, where Marshall would now give the federal jurisdiction away from the state because of exactly stuff like this. <clears throat> All right. So <clears throat> in the late 1820s, you had Georgia anti-Indian laws. State, as um, just to repeat myself again, state assumed legal title of Indian land from the English under the doctrine of discovery. And this is what Chief Justice John Marshall with his first case in the Marshall Trilogy, uh, abolishing all property ownership from Native Americans. Um, the second, and this one really is, you know, Obviously, they all make me upset, but this one really makes me upset. I don't know why, um, because you know they they really. I th I think it's because our governments now are are not ours. They're what the government imposed upon us in in 1934, the Indian Reorganization Act. But here was a time where you had a Native American tribe form their own government, using their own ways. Um, their own constitution and what Georgia did was made their government illegal. Uh, right to assembly was now criminalized, cr criminalized by law. All Cherokee laws null and void. And this leads to the ultimate assumption, and this will have implications when we study Indian gaming and other things. But at the end of the day, the state has always been and always will be the deadliest enemy for Native Americans. Um, so we we always have to keep our eye out on the domestic uh, state politics as much as we can. Obviously, the federal uh, is important, um, but it's really kind of been this historical issue. And so you had the, the Georgia Guard, a paramil paramilitary force created to enforce laws, uh, confiscate Cherokee land, confiscate, confiscate Cherokee gold mines. So essentially, you had these these laws being passed, and then you had to have someone enforce it. So a law doesn't matter unless you can actually enforce it. The Georgia Guard was was just doing that. Um, so in 1830, the crisis came to a head. The Cherokee government had been outlawed; its citizens stripped of their civil liberties and properties. Uh, chaos and intimidation ruled the day. Uh, the Georgia Guard was goose stepping its way into the Cherokee Nation, intimidating Indians, arresting, seizing land, and making all kinds of uh, problems. Uh, essentially though, they would sell their, their uh, land in lottery, uh, and lotteries to squatters and trespassers. Um, all right, uh, so kind of here's how uh, the nuts and bolts of Georgia, um, Cherokee v Nation v. Georgia. So Tassels, he, he was an Indian. He killed an Indian. He was found guilty by the state and sentenced to death. Now, what happened was Marshall ordered the governor, Chief Justice John Marshall, to appear before the Supreme Court. However, the legislature of Georgia directed Gilmore, their governor, um, to, or, to basically bypass and and um ignore the Supreme Court, Gilmore would eventually order the hanging of tassels on December 1830. Again, this is exactly 
the definition of a constitutional crisis. The, the point of a Supreme Court is to interpret and make sure everything is constitutional. You know, the the gun, uh, the, the amendment for guns and all that, you know, gets over and over again uh, being reviewed by the Supreme Court. Um, you know, is this constitutional, right? So essentially, this is what a constitutional crisis looks like when the state and the federal government are not really, they're not working. Um, so Tassel paves the way for the Supreme Court. And so the state of Georgia hung Tassel against the federal court decision and created this constitutional crisis. Ritt, uh, William Ritt, is the attorney for Tassels. And again, the, you know, Cherokee Nation is extremely savvy. They knew exactly what they were doing. They were at the, in many in many regards at the same on the same level of their opponent, right? So they just kind of tit for tat back and forth. Um they hang Tassel, then 3 days later they file this new case uh, rewriting it a little bit um, under this name called Cherokee Nation v. Georgia. So that's kind of the genesis of this case. Um, it was definitely born partly by the very first um, Johnson, um, um, John Marshall case, right? The the Doctrine of Discovery case. But this, this really was born out of the Tassels case uh, directly. Uh, the other one indirectly. Um, so they would challenge the state's const uh, constitutionality of the state's actions. So in it, they brought up the fact that the state was not obeying the Supreme Court, uh, very importantly, uh, and they requ requested to declare Georgia's laws null and void. Ritt would argue. He would have, he would he would uh, inform the Supreme Court of that tassels um, in that case that the state of Georgia evaded judicial review. He would argue that Cherokee Nation was a foreign nation. Therefore, the state was not immune to being sued. That's the only way they could go to court, remember? They had to be a foreign nation. That's the key. They reaffirmed uh, the treaties uh, point. The whole point of treaties was a sovereign, independent nation status, independent state status. Uh, that's what treaties meant in the beginning. Uh, they challenged the doctrine of discovery, saying Indians do not have the right to own, but the right to occupancy. Um, and they had stuff like, you know, we're civilized Christians, agriculturalists, like, hey, we're doing, we're playing ball. We're doing what you want. Anything else? That's really, uh, that's really the, the tr real travesty of the Cherokees is that they were doing everything possible and it didn't matter. Um, and that's really, you know, again, why that, a lot of these things bother me. Uh, I just think about it um, as a tribe, uh, how how incredible they were and what happened to them. Uh, they would point to their tribal constitutions, their courts, their laws, their schools, their churches. Now, um, similar to the first case, Johnson v. McIntosh, uh, it didn't really, you know, go the way people thought. Um, all these three cases are kind of have little screwballs a little bit. Um, but again, it's kind of predicting, it's kind of, you can kind of predict what was going to happen. Um, typically, Supreme Courts do not go, uh, justices do not go against the grain. They go with the grain. They almost always have ideological biases similar to those that are in office. Um, and so... Uh, did Chief Justice John Marshall decide that Cherokee Nation was a foreign nation? That's the question. Or else nothing else matters. Um, it's a 4-2 vote to deny foreign nation status. Uh, majority opinion, those four, vote, four votes, agreed that the Cherokee Nation was more like a state. Now, this would get cleaned up in the next case, the final case, Worcester v. Georgia. You know, but this is kind of the murky time where they're still figuring it out. But it's it's definitive. Indians are not foreign nations or Indian tribes. Uh, he denied uh, foreign nation status. And he wrote, again, interpreting the Constitution, 
Uh, our framers did not view tribes in this way that they had could use the courts. Um, it didn't even have Indians in mind. Again, foreign nation. But see, that's kind of the that's isn't that the interesting part of this? Here, Marshall is saying this is not what the Constitution had in mind. However, what they did have in mind is that they were a foreign nation that you were signing treaties with. You see the hypocrisy in this. I do. Um, so Marshall denied foreign nation status. But there's these two founding principles that would persist to today. And, and, and all the three trilogy, Marshall trilogies, the reason why they're the most important because they form these doctrines, these principles of what it means to be Native American. They define what sovereignty is. Uh, they define what Indian title is. Uh, and in this one, it defines a relationship between us to the federal government. All right. And it's really a paternal um, way of thinking. So, for example, we used to call, and I always think it's weird, George Washington, the great white father. Um, I don't know. Uh, where that came from or how it came to be but you know people say um i've had a, i've had discussions saying oh the guardian war relationship started here right in 1820 um in the late 1820s but the reality is is this was well before that because the verbiage and the and the and the, the relationship was already going this direction this is just when it became the law um, so kind of um, essentially, you know, Native Americans are children. They can't handle their own affairs. So what it meant for us when the BIA took all our resources and money is we had to ask them what to do with it. While they mismanagement and, and embezzled all our money. Um, but they they had our best interest, of course. Right. Uh, we are currently away from that because it became proven over time that the BIA didn't couldn't do better than what we did with our money. So uh, and resources. So now this this is kind of gone, but it's still there. So just to kind of give you a heads up, uh, this is no longer the relationship we have with the government because it was so terrible for so long. Um, and so then finally we have the domestic dependent nations. Uh, he coined this phrase, and it's kind of murky. Um, I still have a hard time with it. Sometimes I'm like, yeah, I get it, and sometimes I'm like, I don't get it. It's kind of a weird type of thing. It's um, I had a professor say it's an, a nation within a state within a nation. But then didn't we say we're not a foreign nation? Like, I don't understand. Uh, I'm Again, it's too complicated. And I think that's how the law is written. It's supposed to be vague and, and uh, just kind of a puzzle on purpose. That's really how I understand the law personally. Uh, domestic dependent nations. Man, Indian nations are subjected to domestic political system. This is kind of uh, Marshall's kind of jam on it. Um, and again, does that does that make any sense? Um, subjected to domestic political systems, but then you go, you fast forward, and then it says, no, you're actually part of the federal system more more than the state. So again, and I think the problem with these definitions is they're 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 always moving. They're always changing and they are always evolving. And we never know where we're at, where we're at until we're 10 years down the road and we look back. Um, so this is the impact of Cherokee v. Georgia. Again, these are the two, this is the most important part of this case, the trust doctrine, which actually goes all the way back to the English and Spanish idea of Native Americans in the 15th, 16th century or 17th. Um, again, it just got kind of codified here. And then the domestic dependent nations. And then ultimately you have, again, the Indian Removal Act follow immediately after this case. Um, and this would be, you know, an immediate and probably the most devastating impact. Um, again, kind of doubling down on Johnson v. McIntosh. Uh, and also after this, and maybe this is the most important one, is that tribes could no longer be litigants in courts up until the 1890s meaning the, the court was shut to Indians because, again, the founders didn't have them in mind. Um, but they did, the founders did um, think they were foreign nations, remember? Again, um, complete hypocrisy. Uh, but John Marshall was a smart guy, I guess. Um, 
Uh, without access to courts, Indians were forced to cede lands and sovereignty. Um, yeah, basically, right? That pretty much says it all. Without access to courts, what can we do? Um, we're pariahs in the American society. Um, we we couldn't we weren't citizens until 1924, um, and maybe that was on purpose. Um, so yeah, it's hard to say which one is the most impactful. I think they're all pretty pretty equally bad. Um, and here's the point, you know, Marshall would kick the sovereignty question down the road in the next case, Worcester v. Georgia. Um, and it's important to mention this. So whenever I can, you know, because this stuff can be depressing after a while, I, I like to talk about the good side of America. There's actually a lot too good to this country. If you And you only know that by studying other countries, right? Um and so, and I've studied a lot of other countries. Um, and again, there's always these figures like Johnson, um, Chief Justice John Marshall, where they're complicated. You know, sometimes bad people do good things, good people do bad things. Um, and this is one of those cases. The question is, is he a good person? I don't know. I'll leave that up to you. Uh, but in the twilight of Marshall's career, he was dismayed at how Johnson and Cherokee were used. These are the first two cases, right? to harm Indians. Uh, and so the question is, you know, when he, when he, when he decided the worst to serve Georgia, okay, I'm, I'll just talk about it and make any slides. Um, he did have a change of heart. So the, in the final case of the trilogy, it was literally, he would die three years later. Um, and the worst to serve Georgia would be his final Indian case. Um, the question is, you know, how did he respond? Did he respond to absolve his conscience? Because he saw what the Inner Removal Act did and all that. And also, was this too little too late? So, you know, again, uh, they were already removed from the East, right? The, um, but there was at least some type of movement away from complete annihilation and genocide. Um, it was a step away because, again, what the Worcester v. Georgia case really was, was checking the state power because the states were the deadliest of enemies. So essentially, that's what the, the final trilogy of the Marshall cases was saying, no, it's back to the federal. Uh, in our Constitution initially, right, in uh, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 3, the Commerce Clause, Indian, matter, Indian uh, affairs are federal. Then all of a sudden it gets kicked over to the state and then back over to the federal. And that's essentially what Worcester served the final case was because he, you know, he was kind of horrified at what the states were doing. Um, so I'll leave that up to you again. Uh, some of these questions, uh, no one will know, but it's cool to ponder. Um, so yeah, keep that in mind and I will see you next, uh, next time. And I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Thanks for, thanks for checking it out.